So my message today is called The Great Fathering Revival. And I want to begin by reading this verse to you, which I think is so prophetic about today, uh, the, the time that we're in, that we should take notice. Verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So if you think it's bad now in families, how bad could it get if God released a curse? That's something we don't need. Amen. We don't need a curse. Not on the face of the earth. So here's a promise that all the Jews know about that Elijah's coming. Or rather what the scripture is saying is, uh, and I don't have time to prove it, is that the spirit and power of Elijah is coming. When John the Baptist was on the earth, Jesus alluded to him as being the Elijah that was to come. Because his disciples said, is it Elijah? And Jesus said, no. And actually he said yes. But what it meant was, it wasn't actually Elijah, it was John the Baptist, because the Bible doesn't teach reincarnation. So John the Baptist was not Elijah. But Jesus was saying that he came in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way for me. Even John the Baptist was asked, are you Elijah? And he said, no, I'm not Elijah. He said, I'm one crying out in the desert, preparing the way for the Lord. And so at the end, here's this prophecy that we know from the book of Malachi has not fully come to pass. It has in part because the spirit of Elijah has always been in the land, if you like, or on the earth through the power of the Holy Spirit. But this is a specific prophecy for a specific time. And here it says that Elijah the prophet will come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, it's a great day for some and a dreadful day for others. <laughs> Amen. I think you in this room, you probably say, that will be a great day. The coming of the Lord will be a great day for the earth, great day for us, great day for the church. Amen. We're all looking for the coming of the Lord. I'm sure you are too. Amen? You can nod and, and you can say yes or no. Or I'm sick of hearing this story like one guy said to me once, stormed out. <clears throat> I said, well, I'm sorry, I don't have a second story. I just only got one. It's called Jesus. <laughs> anyway, the great and the dreadful day. Dreadful for those who have turned against the Lord and speak against him, preach against him and live against him. And there are many like that. So imagine the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at a dreadful time for those on the face of the earth who got it wrong, who refused the truth, refused to believe. But great for others. So there's a great and dreadful day coming. So that day hasn't come yet. We're in a different day right now. We're in the day before that day. The day of salvation, the day of favor. We're in the season of God prior to his return. So at the end of this day, then comes an anointing from God, comes a spirit and a power on who does it come? It comes upon children and it comes upon fathers to restore relationships. There is an anointing from heaven coming upon men, I believe, but I also believe it's non-generic, so it comes upon women too, but it's specifically for men to rise up and be dads. Men to rise up and be fathers. Usually what happens when the Lord wants to do something is that the devil tries to get there first and bring an opposite reaction. An opposite spirit. So what we've seen across the world and, and in our nation, in our city, and perhaps, and you've been affected by it, is a desertion of responsibility by men. Runaway fathers. Or fathers who are present but not present. Just broken men in homes. Not able to be who God's called them to be. Probably deep in their heart wishing they could be somebody else, but they're not unfortunately, because of the lack of response or the inability to respond or the unwillingness to respond in their lifetime to the wooing of the Holy Spirit and to the calling of God upon their lives. And so they failed to become fathers in the true sense of the word of it. What the earth needs today is fathers. Hallelujah. And I think this is what God's doing. He's releasing a spirit called the spirit of Elijah upon fathers. Hallelujah. To be fathers. And I think it's the response of fathers first to reach out to the children before it ever would be a child's response to respond to that love. I don't think children, they want to love their dads, but unless their dad reaches out to them, it's difficult. 
My dad's been dead for 29 years. I'm, I'm st I love him now more than ever because I realize what it must have been like for him to be a father in the age that he lived in. I'm still waiting for him to say, I love you, which is crazy because he's been dead for 29 years. He did die and give his heart to the Lord before he died, and he is in heaven, and I want to have a talk to him. I don't want to tell him how bad he is. I want to tell him how much I love him, how much I longed for him. All my brothers long for him, and they're in their 60s now. Isn't it crazy? They themselves are fathers and grandfathers, including me, some of them, longing for the hug of their uh, earthly dad who's not there anymore. How crazy is that? There's something inside of us that needs our dad. It ne it ne and in that, he affirms our identity and our inheritance in that connection. I'm not alone. I'm, and some of you here do not have your earthly father. I've not had an earthly father for a long time. But I'll tell you this, is inside every one of you is an identity that needs affirmation. It needs acceptance and needs approving. And that's what dads do. That's what they do. That's what fathers do. They give that. And in that, there's this warding off of rejection. Rejection is a satanic plot to cut you off from your father. Not just on earth, but in heaven also. Hallelujah. But I believe this, that we're entering the last phase of the church. And part of that phase is the great fathering anointing or the great fathering revival. And I believe that there's a revival in, in, in the fact that from heaven comes a download into the hearts of fathers and begins to change them, begins to soften their hearts and give them a love again for children and to reach out to boys. Exactly what's happening in Shed 2 today is the love of the Father, God, immersing those boys in, in, a father's, in acceptance, uh, exactly what those boys need. They also need to be worn out through activity <laughs> amen <laughs> they need instruction okay it's not just all about just love but those boys need a strong hand amen and for so and it's just not about that teens things not just about boys it's for girls too but it just seems that there's a whole bunch of boys here and and a couple of girls so maybe the girls did the girls go yeah. oh isn't that great they went good on them yeah. beautiful daughters hey beautiful girls now, i want to make a couple of statements to you this morning because I think this message is a signature message for a season to come. And I think we're stepping into it. So prophetically I know it. I know it in my own heart how God is leading me to be a father. And an apostolic father. The, the, the fathering anointing is apostolic. And so don't be worried about that word. The apostolic just means it's a function, a gift to the body to allow the body to be everything it's meant to be. When father's home, everybody can relax. When dad's here, everybody gets to do what they're supposed to do. And I believe this, when a fathering anointing comes upon the church, everybody in that church can rise up into their own callings, regardless of what it is. It's not stunted in one area of growth. There's just a completeness about it when there's a fathering anointing come across the church. In fact, the whole church picks it up. And you can come in and you can feel like you're at home. And that's exactly what we want you to do. Feel like you're at home. People said to us, they walked in the door and said, it feels like home. They said, how do you know? We haven't showed up yet. There's an anointing in the atmosphere that just it feels like home. Somebody sat down and said, it feels like home. I said, you haven't even met us yet. <laughs> you don't know what we're like. Just joking with them. Here's the first statement. You have a purpose. That's what fathers do. They cause people to understand their purpose in life. You have a purpose. And God knew about that purpose long before you were born. God has already finished your purpose, is the second statement I want to give you. So you have a purpose. But the second statement is a little odd to the human logic. God has already finished your purpose. He said, well, that's strange. I don't even know what it is, and he's already finished. A lot of us are still struggling to discover what it is we're meant to be doing in life. And yet, oh, here's God saying, I finished. <laughs> you see, if God were, starts with you, he starts from the end and works backwards because he's already there at the end. See, God is omnipresent, not just in the present, he's omnipresent in the past and in the future. It's all liquid and fluid to him. He's already in your future. He's there right now. 
You haven't lived long enough to get to your future, but God is already there. It's outside my mind to think. It's just not logical. But God doesn't function in earthly logic. So he's already at your end. Saying, wow, that was a good life. He said, well, I haven't even lived it. Yes, you have, according to me. I've seen the end. So it's not just a piece of paper where God says, I see, he knows the beginning from the end. No, he's at the end. He's also at the beginning. And he's in the middle. And he's every step of the way with you. Wow, and that's the Father walking with you. That must make you feel a little bit secure, knowing that you will never be alone, ever. Not on any day. And on every day, he knows the step that you take and he knows the day of your victory and he knows when you will, really will overcome and he knows and that's why he keeps working with you because he sees the end product just like you feel like giving in sometimes and I'm sure you do but God says you should just try again because I, I'm at the end I know you finished the race Amen I saw you cross the line you, you can't quit now I've seen you cross the line don't abort the mission of your purpose come with me to Proverbs uh, chapter 19, verse 20 and 21. This is the great fathering revival and you have a purpose. You really do. And that purpose was in the heart of God. He designed it to be the way it is. And this is what this scripture says in, in verse 20 and verse 21 of Proverbs chapter 19. Listen to the counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. There are many plans in the man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel will stand. You may have plans, but God's counsel will stand. That's why you find yourself often going in the opposite direction to what you planned. Because God is leading your life. The steps of a good man and a good woman are ordered by the Lord. Think about that. He guides your steps. This gets a little bit more exciting as you press on. Because I know a lot of people who really aren't 100% sure if what they're doing is what they're supposed to be doing. My answer is just do what you do. Do it with all your might. Do it with all your strength. Because if you do what's in front of you, even if you don't think it's the thing, you'll eventually find the thing. God will make sure of that. His counsel will stand. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 1, which is one of my favorite pieces of scripture about God's blueprint for your life. You have a purpose. You do have a purpose and you do have a reason. Not just because God wanted to love you, but he wants you to do something. He wants you to be something. He wants you to fulfill it and enjoy it. It's yours. Ephesians 1. Verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose you before he made the earth. God's got a great memory. It's very detailed and very accurate and he never forgets. <coughs> People say elephants have good memories. I, I don't really know about that. But God made elephants. So he must have put a little bit of his memory power in an elephant. They have really good smell memories. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That's his call. He called you to be blameless and with, with love. Amen? Without blame, holy and in love. From the foundation of the, That's his calling upon you. And his, that's his counsel of your life. And it's a gift from God. So I can't measure up to it. You're not meant to. What you're meant to do is yield to God and he will cause you to measure up. Amen? This is the best deal going. Religious Christians think they've got to work hard. Free Christians just think they have to yield and love God. And I prefer that one because I change in the atmosphere of love. I change when I'm yielded to God. This is his counsel that's standing for you. And yet now in the same chapter of Ephesians 1, we find in verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather... In one, all things in Christ Jesus, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So we find that God has a counsel of his will which he will not change. 
He designed you and he's not changing you. You are already an original. Why would you want to be another original? You are not a copy. You are a blueprint of something that is not copied anywhere else. There never will be another you. And not only that, he said, being predestined according to his purpose. See, you have a purpose. Predestined. I'm not a fatalist because God gave me choice to choose. So a lot of the things I suffer is my fault. If I get a speeding ticket, that was not predestined by God. That's because I chose to speed at the wrong time. <laughs> and I am wondering about the last time I went past that vehicle, whether or not something's coming in the mail. <coughs> that was not predestined by God, I can tell you that now. That, that was me. <laughs> so... Listen, according all the works who works according... So he is going to let you know the things you're doing for God is what he planned a long time ago, eons ago. Maybe there are books, old books, with your name in it. A list of the things you're doing now is... Imagine finding that in a book. Robin, imagine finding the, the story of China in, in your book long before China ever was a nation. Now, Robin and Theo... This is what they're going to be doing. And, and so you go back on, and, and you look on that book, and you go, oh my God, wow, he's in charge. That's the counsel of God, and it will stand. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he will not change his mind. You can try to abort your mission from God if you want to, but he's determined to cause you to rise up and carry on through. Come with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 46. Because I said to you, God has already finished your purpose. You have a purpose and he's finished it. And you're now living it out. In Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10, it says, Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. You can say, but God, it's impossible. Not for him it's not. His counsel will stand. He declares the end from the beginning. So he calls you to do something. Maybe it's to work with teenagers. He already knows exactly what's going to happen in Shed 2. He knows how many children are going to come through there. He knows how many kids are going to get touched. He knows who's going to work in that ministry. He knows how long that ministry will last for. He, he knows all of these things. It's exciting. When you're going out to do a venture for the Lord, you need to know that he's with you. His resources are with you. His planning department is already in action for you. You're not alone. And it could be that that very thing was written down a long time ago. Wow. When we packed our first shipping container, we weren't really sure if that's what God wanted us to do. When we sent it away, raised the money, which took us a long time to do, and it was a lot of effort, we all relaxed and went, wow, that's it. Thank you, God. That, you know, beginning and end of the shipping ministry. That wasn't what, that's what we said. That was our counsel to God. All done, dusted. You beauty. We did it, Lord. We obeyed you. <laughs> He's like, listen, it's my counsel that was done, and you only just started. You ain't finished yet. You only just begun. You need a bigger capacity because I'm going to send you so much stuff you don't even know what to do with it. We want to start a teens ministry in there and there's beds all over the place. We wanted to pack them yesterday but we got rained off. So we got these multiple streams of things happening and God is not letting us off any of them. He will remind you about your calling in life. You have a purpose and God has already finished your purpose. He declares it. It's heavenly logic. Now purpose feeds momentum. It's very easy to motivate somebody who's on purpose, who knows what they're doing and why they're doing it. And so the encouragement for them just fires them up to get into their purpose. But if you give someone motivation who has no purpose in life and feels like they're just drifting along, then they're only going to be encouraged for the time that they remember what you said to them. Tomorrow, that, all that encouragement will evaporate because there's nothing for that purpose to latch onto. 
And so you're going to have to pump them up again the following week and then the following and the following week until the, all of a sudden it gels in them, I am a child of God. I have a calling and I have a purpose. Once these things settle in you, rejection leaves your life. And rejection is one of the primary causes of abortion of purpose. Because you don't think you can. You don't think because you, you have a voice speaking to you that says you're not accepted. You're not wanted. I can't do these things. I can't. I can't. And, and so your own view of yourself is distorted and does not match the view of God's blueprint for your life. So what's the truth and what's a lie? I'd like to say to you that what God is saying about you is true and what you think about yourself is a lie. Until you match up and agree with God's statements over you. That might sound a little bit rough. But I want to tell you this, that the devil has seeded you with rejection to do two things to your life. The first is to steal your identity and the second is to steal your future, your inheritance in Christ. And if he can destroy your identity or make you worried about who you really are and you're not sure, then it's very easy for him to dislodge you from purpose. Purpose leads you to destiny. Or, sorry, purpose is destiny that leads you to destination. My destiny is doing what I'm doing right now. My destination is heaven. My purpose is clear. I'm not in any doubt about what I, I used to be a long time in my life thinking, what the heck am I supposed to be doing with my life? And so I was vulnerable to demonic attack upon me. Vulnerable for identity destruction. When I was water baptized, the pastor prophesied over Francis and I when I came up. And he said, my son, he gave this long prophecy which I can't remember. All I remembered was, God called me my son. I couldn't believe it. I'm a son. God accepts me as a son. I thought about it for so long. It impacted me so much. And those two words went down into my soul and began to heal me of the lies that I had believed. One of those lies was, I don't know if my father really loves me because he didn't say it enough times. And I know that he did. He just didn't say it. You've got to say it. Are you hearing me? Fathers, are you hearing me? You've got to say to your children, I love you. Those kids will lap it up like a cat licking up milk. <laughs> Amen? Purpose feeds motivation. In Hebrews 11, chapter 20, it says that Isaac, by faith, blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. Now, I've read that a number of times, but I missed the words concerning the things to come. I never, it just, I read through it and I thought, oh, wow. He didn't just bless them. I bless you, my sons, for your future life, whatever it's going to be. No, no. He blessed them and prophesied concerning the things to come. In other words, he spoke over their lives about the milestones they will achieve in the years to come in their life. He spoke and prophesied things over them. That's what fathers do. They speak to their children concerning the things to come. And they set them on their journey. And they leave on that journey, feeling good about themselves, knowing who they are deep on the inside of their life. Even the devil tried to fool Jesus by saying, if you are the Son of God. I mean, if he's going to try it with Jesus, don't you think he's going to try it with you? If you're the Son of yeah, you're the Son of yeah, right, as if. <laughs> Why would you sing that song, I am a child of God, if you didn't believe it? I'm really trying to believe and the reason why you're trying to believe is because rejection is speaking louder than the Word of God. And it's one of the root causes that we all struggle with. It's a satanic attack, not just on the body of Christ, but on humanity. Because the devil hates humans, because he knows that we've taken his place. And so he wants to crush every one of you. And I, if I interviewed you all, and I know most of you, I know that most of you struggle with elements of rejection in your life. And we seem to battle it and battle it and battle it. And we get better and we get better and we get, we get stronger and we get stronger and we cast the thing out. But it's amazing how powerful our memory is of the things that were said to us long ago. I mean, I remember stupid things. I don't know if it's because I'm a Yorkshireman, but I was playing volleyball with my teachers because we were a pretty good volleyball team. 
And we were leaving for New Zealand. And I wore a badge that day. Viva Team Manager. <laughs> Viva was a car back in the 60s, by the way. And uh, it was just a badge kids got. You know, I'm the Viva Team Manager. And he said to me, Ken, you couldn't even manage an old woman's tea party. You know, it was a put down on me. And even though I didn't realize what, that, what he was even saying to me was, I think, I think I probably couldn't actually manage an old woman's. I don't even know what women do. It, or, I don't even, you know, I'm a 15 year old boy. I don't know what women do at tea parties. I was thinking to myself, I'd rather be a Viva team manager than a managing an old woman. Mind you, I think now, being a pastor for a long time, I'm quite good at managing old women's tea parties. Hey, come on, that teacher was wrong. Yeah. Amen. He was wrong. But God had to heal me of that. Now I can take a little bit of punishment from the devil because I know he's a liar. I can take it on the chin because I know that that's rubbish. I am a son. I'm not just a child of God. I'm a son of God. One of the things I want to hear coming from those teenagers is this statement, I'm a son of God. Or at least I'm a child of God. Once we know they're freely saying it and not just parroting it, when they freely say it, then they're talking about what they truly believe down in the core of their belly. Once they've got that, they can get purpose. Isn't that good? You see, a fathering anointing that comes on a church, I think will do four main things. This is what happens in our church. Number one, it brings freedom. We sang about that liberty today. Fear, I'm free from fear. Freedom comes under that anointing of the truth of God when lies are exposed and uprooted. Freedom's a wonderful thing because then the chains are broken. You're no longer in bondage to anything else, particularly fear. And I said to you this morning, I really saw it in the spirit that fear was really linked into a root cause of rejection. Cast rejection out and boldness comes on your life and courage comes upon you and you're willing to have a go at things and you're not afraid because of what people may say or even what you might say if you're afraid. You can do it because God brings you into the liberty of the sons of God and it's real. Isn't it good? God's still delivering me from fears as you've known about my journey. I had a lot of fears and I've still got some fears. But I've got less now. And I can look any man in the eye and talk to him. It's pretty dangerous, actually. Because <laughs> I just say what I think to anybody. And I, I will. Some things I, I'm quiet. I was quiet yesterday watching Eli play soccer because I wanted to talk to the coach about the team. Then I watched another game at the under-16s of playing and I wanted, for some reason, wanted to talk to their coach. I wanted to ask him, why, why did you put a right-footed winger on the left wing when she has to turn around and, and, and this is the under-16s team. And uh, I nearly spoke up publicly. I had to stop myself because it irritated me that this great team was losing because they put the wrong person in the wrong place. Anyway, the Englishman in me rose up and said, be quiet. Don't make a fuss. That's what English people say. Don't make a fuss. That's what my mother would have said. Ken, don't make a fuss. You know, they know what they're doing. I said, no, they don't know what they're doing, Mum. Anyway, going to watch Eli play soccer is as frustrating for me as it is for him playing in the team that he's playing in right now. So I got so frustrated yesterday watching Eli that I wanted to speak out publicly. And I thought, oh, my goodness, Ken. You know. But you see, I've lost that fear of man. I can speak out, and I will. And you see, that's what happens when God brings freedom to your life. You can speak. Sometimes it's out of turn and, and wrong, but, but hey, you know, some, a nation puts decorum in place because they want everyone to shut up. But there's things we need to speak up about. Oh, no, we don't talk about that. Yes, we do. That's taboo. No, it isn't. Well, marriage should be between a man and a woman. And they want us to shut up because they want to change the goalposts. And I'm not going to shut up, and you shouldn't shut up about it either. You should speak up. Oh, no, Christians should be quiet and just... No, they shouldn't. There's too many voices shouting in this nation. And you should be free, not be intimidated by others. Just because they seem to be making a valid... They're not making a valid point. They're lying. That's what they're doing. So, 
purpose feeds motivation. So you can be really motivated if you know what your purpose is and you're on your way. And so a word from somebody can just spark you up because you're on the journey already. That's so exciting. So easy to motivate somebody who's moving forward. I like that. I love people moving forward. I really do. Because they're easy to move. See, some, somebody's moving, it's easy to steer. It's difficult to steer people who are sitting down. So people say to me, what should I do, Pastor? Can I say, do anything. <laughs> Pick something. Have a go. Don't you know what my purpose is? No, not really. But you're the pastor. I say, well, I still don't know. <laughs> I'm not a guru. I don't live on top of a mountain. You're supposed to come and tell me what your purpose is. Oh, that's back to front. No, it's not back to front. If I knew what all your purposes were, I'd tell you. I'd send you emails. I'd, I'd, I'd shout it from the rooftops. But the thing is, God doesn't tell me because he knows I'm not to manipulate your life. I'm not here to determine what your role is. It's already predetermined. Discovery takes place when you're doing something. So it's easy to motivate someone who knows their purpose. Moses said in Exodus chapter 4, verse 13, send someone else. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's 80 years old. 80 years old before he clicks into the main purpose for his life. 80. Think about that. And so God tells him to go to Pharaoh, and he says, can you send somebody else, please? <laughs> you think, now we can laugh because we read the story. He's 80, for goodness sake. God didn't tell him, oh, and you're going to have to lead him through the desert for 40 years because they're going to be a really bad bunch of people to lead. But he didn't tell him that. He just said, go and talk to Pharaoh. And he said, can you send somebody else? <laughs> uh, you know something? You say that too. Every time you say no, you say, you're effectively saying, send somebody else. So be careful. I, I find in church, um, God really uses the roles and responsibilities as part of his kingdom development for people. And I know that it's no light thing when we ask you to do something. It could be anything. And church isn't just the only place for this. It's all of your life. But church is a place where God particularly uses the things you do to get you to your purpose. You know, you can't just be a prophet just like, you can't just on day one, I'm a prophet. God will put you through the PIT to be a prophet. The pit. The prophet in training. You've heard about that one? Yeah, if you're, uh, the, I don't know what the one is for the apostle, but it's worse. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long training program. It's about 20 years, I'd say. Probably more. I don't know. But you don't just want to be those things because God will show you how much you're going to have to suffer for him if you want that kind of role. You will suffer for Jesus anyway. You should do a suffer. A, 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 a study on suffering and find out how far away glory is around the word suffering in the Bible. And if everybody wants the glory of God, but not the suffering, they go together. One produces the other. Come on, friends. This is a great fathering. And so I believe fathers are rising up in the church even today. I don't want to be an instructor. There's lots of instructors. Everybody's got an opinion. You just read Facebook. All the instruction... I don't know how many times a week someone says, if you don't post this or share this, you're not part of it. And I say, well, you're talking to someone who is a contrarian by spirit, and I'm not going to do it just because you said it. <laughs> Even my digital watch said to me, we didn't say it, but it, there's a little, a little two words. Final warning, it says. My watch said to me, final warning. I said, what, has it been warning me all night long and I've just noticed now? The battery's going out. So it's telling me, final warning. So I spoke to my wife and said, I don't care. Just because she said final warning. Who do you think you are to talk to me? I own you. Final warning, my foot. I'll plug you in when I'm ready to plug you in. Who's in charge here? I know you don't talk to your watch like that, but that's, they're the thoughts I had. I thought, you watch. Who made you? I'm watching you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to read to you verse 11 I'm going to, it's way past 11 so I'm going to 
just read this one verse to you. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Can I have the music team, please? I was on the, the banks of the Lusemfwa River in Zambia, <coughs> central western province, with a team. Brett and Tay were there. Early in the morning I got up after listening to lions roaring the night before. It's quite exciting. It was frightening for Brett and Tay, but exciting for me. Because I was in the tent where the, the guides were and they said, oh, the lions are on the other side of the river. But just they didn't tell Brett and Taylor that. They thought the lions were outside the tent. <clears throat> so they were scared all night and I just thought it was beautiful, listening to the lions roaring. The next morning I got up and there was Pastor Kelly, uh, Sean Kelly on the beach. I brought him a coffee and he said, Ken, it's amazing you've just walked down here. He said, I've got a word from you, for you from God. I said, oh, what is it? He said, it's Isaiah chapter 46 verse 11, which is the one I just read you. He said, you are the bird of prey. You are the man from a far country, the man from the east who comes to execute the counsel of the Lord. God will perform it. And this is the thing. God said, I have spoken it. I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will do it. I read those four statements from God and I thought, I'm not even in charge of this. My life. It's mapped out for me. And God very strongly telling me, don't you try to do it. Don't you think you're going to achieve this. No, 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 no. Your purpose is purposed by God. Your purpose is powered by Him. He will do it. He has spoken it already. Did you hear what I just said to you? I'm ministering to you now. Your purpose is already spoken out by God. It's already an active prophetic word out there over your life. Come on, friends. God says, I spoke it. I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will do it. What you need to be is a willing participant in the journey. Would you stand to your feet, please? And God has sent fathers to bring you to the place of acceptance of purpose, to love you through the journey to get there. And the delight of a father is to release sons and daughters into their calling. Amen, John. It's to release people. To let people go. To applaud the kids as they get on with it. And feel proud of them. I feel proud of you. We welcome more people to come. If you find your purpose for life in this place, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Another tick for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. I say glory to God for you. Glory to God for you. Finding your place in the kingdom of the Lord. Come on, friends. Some of you have got to just get on this journey. You've got to pick up a bat and walk out and face, face the guy throwing the ball. He needs someone to throw something because you can't hit it otherwise. And then you discover that your pitcher is God. He tosses one to you and says, whack that, son. So the next thing you whack it and you miss it completely. And you think, oh, what an idiot I am. So he says, no, i got another ball. You throw that one and you, and you top it and it goes behind you. Out. <laughs> miss it three times. Only in God's game, you don't have to walk back to the dugout. You can just keep swinging. Maybe you just need to keep swinging. May you be encouraged today to have a swing about your life. Come on. The devil's a liar. Every reason why you can't serve God is a lie. You are predestined, pre-purposed. How exciting. <laughs>